Welcome psychology. This is the psychological study of consciousness. So we typically begin each lecture with some definition of terms. Consciousness is the awareness of everything going on inside and outside of you. So I just want to ask this question. Uh, when you sleep, are you conscious? Most students usually respond and say no. Half the class says no, half the class says yes. One or two say kinda. And actually, if you were to say kinda, yes, that's the right answer. So consciousness is the awareness of everything going on inside and outside. And when you're sleeping, you're in an altered state of consciousness. So what that means is you are in kind of this lucid connection with reality. So as you're asleep, uh, for instance, you probably have had the experience of turning your alarm off uh, and, or maybe even setting another alarm and you don't remember this. You don't. Um, you probably have had the experience of falling asleep during a show and actually incorporating elements of this show into your dream. Uh, this is an example of an altered state of consciousness and frankly it's one of the most interesting things that I talk about. So we're going to talk about consciousness, sleep, and dreaming, as well as drug use in this chapter. There's other types of altered states of consciousness, such as um, hypnotism, but just for the sake of time, we don't talk about that as much. Here you have a young lady, I presume, uh, is in an altered state of consciousness. So anything that you would do to alter brainwave activity is an altered state of consciousness. If you're not in an altered state of consciousness, if you're in normal um, think pa think, uh, thought patterns, normal sensations, that's what we call waking consciousness. In psychology, uh, we'll study altered states of consciousness and what I have found over um, 10 plus years in the classroom is that my students all sleep. Now you probably don't sleep as much as you should and you probably know this. So this speaks to your sleep hygiene, the sleep habits that you have. All of us have a circadian rhythm which is our internal body clock or our bodily rhythm. So this typically means you'll fall asleep at the same time every night and wake up every time, wake up the same time every day uh, if you have sleep hygiene. Uh, and if you have great sleep hygiene you will naturally get sleepy sometime after it's dark outside and you'll wake up sometime uh, slightly before sunbreak, um, daybreak. So this is regulated by the hypothalamus, which is a tiny section of brain that influences glandular systems. So your suprachiasmatic nucleus is an internal clock. It tells you when to fall asleep and when to wake up. This basically talks to the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin and helps you get sleepy. However, if you're not sleeping like you need to, if you're, man, if you're male, you typically need six to nine hours of sleep a night. If you're female, you typically need seven. Uh, excuse me, I messed that up. If you're male, you need six to eight usually, and females, you need seven to nine. And if you don't get this, which I would say the majority of my students do not. So if you don't get this kind of good sleep, you will find yourself in sleep deprivation. This is sleep loss that impairs concentration. You start to get a little irritability, uh, cranky, maybe snippy, maybe a little salty with your family and friends. Um, and most dangerously, you can find yourself nodding off. Something like 35% of college students say they have nodded off while they're driving. I would say that that's probably a conservative estimate. And there's different theories as to why we sleep at night and wake up during the day. Research indicates that most people perform better when they are getting enough sleep at night and alert during the day. So there's an adaptive theory which just says that over time we have adapted to sleep at night because that's when the predators are out. There's the restorative theory which basically says our 
brains, specifically our brain cells need to repair and they repaired uh, doing, during REM sleep. So if you look at this chart, REM sleep happens from uh, during infancy about 50% of the time. REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement. We will get into this later on in the talk. But let's go back to brain functioning and the connection between getting enough rest and when you sleep. Research indicates that air traffic controllers working a night shift, so this is a, a midnight shift from, 7, from 12 uh, p.m. to 7 a.m., their performance was significantly impaired after work when compared to an eight-hour shift during the day. So this is sobering if you think about the people landing airplanes uh, are not as crisp and sharp as they would be if they're sleeping through the day, uh, if they're sleeping at night and waking before daybreak. So I oftentimes in class will ask my students, talk about experiences they've had working late at night. Most of my students describe this grogginess. And I once had a student who described sleep deprivation psychosis. That's right. If you're not getting enough sleep, if you're severely sleep depri deprived, you can start hallucinating. Um, I knew one, someone personally after about four days of not sleeping began to see and hear things that were not there. So sleep is definitely something that we need to take seriously. But I want to be sure that I'm clear about this. The type of sleep, the quality of sleep, and even when you sleep are all important in terms of sleep hygiene. And the reason why those variables are important speaks to the brain activity that's happening in uh, kind of behind the scenes. So we have beta waves, which are small, faster waves, and these happen when a person is wide awake, mentally active. If you're watching this lecture and you're engaged and taking notes, and uh, let's hope the beta waves are in full effect. But when you become relaxed, this is what we would call stage one. And what's happening is theta waves begin to uh, become evident. So in our brains, we start to nod off. So here you have a person uh, reading a book and uh, they find themselves sort of nodding. And I describe this as that, my students refer to it as that jerk thing. You know, when you're, you lay down and you just kind of jerk. What's happening is in your brain, brainwave patterns change. You're in stage one sleep and these are theta waves. Now, a lot of my students report this experience of when they do this jerk thing, oftentimes it is corresponding with an image. You might have dreamed that you're falling off a cliff and you wake up. So then I ask this question, and I'll ask it to you guys. Do you dream, and therefore jerk, or are you doing a hypnic jerk and therefore the images occur? So it's another way of, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Researchers now suggest that your, your, hyp your hypnic, hypnagogic image is following the jerk. So as your brain waves change, your hypnagogic images are basically your brain's way of sort of interpreting what's going on. And this is actually what would happen throughout the night when you go into REM, because when you go to REM sleep, uh, this is how we dream. You would be jerking throughout the night, waking up, uh, if it were not for an REM paralysis. Your body actually knocks you out. Some of you have had the experience of having a, a dream and you become awake, but you can't physically wake up. Mentally, you're awake, but your body is uh, paralyzed. This is REM paralysis, and uh, it's all part of the normal process of what's going on behind the scenes. So stage two sleep happens when our temperature begins to change, um, our breathing and heart rate decrease, and 
Stage three and four is delta wave sleep. Now this is where growth hormones are released. It's very hard for you to wake up during this deep sleep. I've heard this referred to as the, the train wreck sleep because this feels, if you were to take, uh, so maybe you didn't sleep well at all and you take this, you wanna take this monster nap and someone wakes you up about 45 minutes in, well, you're gonna be disoriented. And the reason for the disoriented feeling is that your brain waves are very slow. So you can't really process. You don't know whether it's five o'clock at night or five o'clock in the morning. So let's talk about REM sleep, rapid eye movement. Your eyes are actually moving under your eye, your eyelids. Your eyeballs are like kind of moving back and forth very, very fast. Um, and 90% of dreaming involves this REM. Infants will spend 50% of their time in REM sleep. This is really important because they are have these cells. We all have these, these brain cells called glial cells, G-L-I-A-L. And the glial cells are really active in infancy because they help your brain form these structures, almost like a, like a system of, of scaffolds and ladders that enable your brain cells to come online. Really important that little babies get the sleep that they need. And it's really important that you get the sleep that you need. One of my favorite graphs is a chart of what happens at night in your brain. This is really the map of the behind the scenes and why we need sleep so much. I think it sheds light on how important this is to your whole body. So when you're awake and you lay down and you start, you first uh, start to fall asleep. You basically will see this REM sleep, and um, this the green line represents REM and dreaming sleep. So you actually will usually have your first session of dreaming within the first 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and if you wake up during this time, that's when you have that experience of jerking and waking up and you felt you were dreaming of falling off a cliff or something. But uh, most of the time, you're going to go right to sleep. And you'll go to stage two. Your heart rate starts to slow down. You go into stage three. You have the sleep spindles. And then you get into stage four. And this is where you find delta wave sleep, where you are out. Um, and this is so important because, especially for those who are physically active, maybe in a blue-collar job or lifting weights or running, or participating in a sport on campus, you really need your seven to eight hours of sleep because uh, the delta waves actually help repair muscle that you tear. And we all tear muscle in life, but very active people need a lot of delta wave sleep. In fact, if you're physically active, you're gonna spend more time than average here in stage three and four. If you're emotional and uh, say you're in a high stress job, it's stressing you out you actually get a knot in your stomach sunday night because you have to go to work at eight in the morning you're going to spend more time in rem sleep and this is fascinating because it seems as though our dreams help repair us emotionally it's kind of like your brain has wear and tear and it is worn down because of the emotional stress. So we dream when we're stressed and we dream about the things we're stressed about. If you're physically taxed, you'll, you may report saying, uh, saying something like, I don't really dream. Well, all of us dream, but some people may not remember their dreams because they're sleeping uh, more because of physical labor in uh, stage three and four, spending more time than average. And as you go through the night, you're going to see fewer sessions of three and four and more sessions of of uh, REM sleep. Now sleep disorders also one of my favorite things to talk about in students. Um, I ask my students oftentimes about their most bizarre sleepwalking story and over the years I've gotten some phenomenal and very weird stories. One student described waking up the next morning after going to sleep, waking up surrounded by pots. 
So apparently this individual, while asleep, got up, went to the kitchen, and got not just one pot, but every pot in the house. I had another student who woke up. He tells me after class one day, he has a, a shirt like mine, a uh, long sleeve, and he pulled it up, and there's scars. Apparently, he had a sleep disorder where he became very violent, and he actually punched out the window in his bedroom. So he wakes up in the middle of the night with blood everywhere. Well, these sleep disorders can be kind of frightening. Um, some of these you're probably more familiar with. I'm going to run over a few of these sleep problems. Now, sleep walking and sleep talking are both referred to as somnambulism. But sleepwalking is moving, walking around during deep sleep. Um, night terrors. Young children more frequently have these. It's not just a bad dream, as the PowerPoint says. It's really a screaming, and kicking, and yelling. And it happens when a youngster is in ch is, uh, stage four sleep. And they're very difficult to wake up, very resistant to being wakened up. Night terrors are different than nightmares. A nightmare is simply a stage one bad dream. Night terrors are stage four. So the, the two are different because of what's happening in, in the brain. And that's important for us to keep in mind. Now these three individuals here, Scott Fowler, Stephen Steinberg, and Ken Parks, um, ha, were all um, in, accused of crimes, and they all attempted to use sleepwalking as a defense for murder. This may seem bizarre, but there have been individuals who have been acquitted for murder because psychologists have testified that it is possible to do very bizarre and strange things while asleep. So if someone has a history of sleepwalking, um, this REM, it's, it's actually referred to as uh, a, a sleep disorder, um, REM behavioral disorder, it, it is known by, it doesn't always happen in REM sleep, but my student who stood up in the middle of the night and punched his window out, um, I also had another student over the years, uh, a few years back, who woke up and his car was running. Ignition, a key in the ignition, cranked, and he comes to and his car is running. He has no memory of walking out the house. Uh, if you have a story about this, if something like this has happened to you and you, you uh, found yourself waking up in strange places, be sure to share this in the discussion board. It's very interesting to, to find out how common this is. But on one occasion, uh, Kenneth Parks actually uh, woke up to the sound of a gunshot, and he looks down, and a gun is in his hand, and a relative is dead. And he, what's more bizarre is that he lived all the way across town from this relative. He had a great relationship with the relative. It was, there was no motive for murder. Now, Scott Fowler and Steven Steinberg uh, Fowler especially used the Kenneth Parks case uh, to justify murder, but uh, Fowler and Steinberg were guilty. Parks was acquitted. Other problems uh, found in sleep. Insomnia, the inability to get to sleep, stay asleep, or get a good quality of sleep. Narcolepsy probably more familiar with this, person falls asleep immediately into cataplexy, which is the, the loss of muscle tone. So it's like they fall immediately into REM paralysis. Um, I had a student one time who said they, they uh, fell asleep while they're driving. I, I had, a, I had a, a couple students over the years who've reported this. One has said that their friend in the driver's seat fell asleep. All right. Uh, so a lot of times if this happens, person is diagnosed with narcolepsy, uh, usually they are not allowed to drive. Dreams. Sigmund Freud said the reason why we have dreams was uh, because they, they represent subconscious uh, wishes, subconscious desires. 
Uh, more modern theories, such as the activation synthesis hypothesis, says that dreams are created to explain brainstem activity. Uh, and so this is interesting when we think of how common these experiences are. Most of you have had dreams. Some of you had a friend maybe sleep over who sleepwalked. Maybe you had a relative who sleepwalked. And uh, if this is the case for you, be sure to drop a note in this in the discussion board so we can discuss this. Um, like I said, we're going to skip over hypnosis just for the sake of time and move to psychoactive drugs. So most of you might have taken psychoactive drugs this morning. Uh, if you've taken caffeine, you've taken a psychoactive drug. A psychoactive drug is not necessarily a drug that's illegal. It is a drug that alters thinking, perception, and memory. Some psychoactive drugs are legal. Cocaine and opium used to be legal at one point. You know a drug is causing physical addiction or dependence when you need more of this substance than you used to to get the same level of high. That is drug tolerance. You also know you're physically addicted if you don't get the, the, the drug and you start to experience side effects. All right? You have symptoms, so it could be um, ranging from mild to very severe depending on the drug, but uh, headaches, everything from headaches to um, people um, under severe drug addiction have violent fevers and vomiting and shaking, night sweats people refer to. Um, and so this creates a pattern of negative reinforcement where the person who has the chemical dependency feels, oh, I have to get this substance, not because I'm having withdrawal symptoms now, but I will if I don't. So this negative reinforcement is very common and it's even been built into some of the screening protocols. So if you know anyone that has had an alcohol addiction, if they've gone into treatment, the first question they're asked is, do you drink alcohol in the morning? And the reason why you're asked, do you drink alcohol in the morning, is because uh, alcoholics are trying to avoid, right? They're, this is part of training. Uh, it's kind of like a person drinking coffee who the night before they go to sleep, they put the coffee in the coffee pot and they set the alarm so that when they wake up, they drink their coffee first thing and they don't have headaches. Same kind of principle. But there is also a psychological addiction. Uh, so marijuana, for instance, is not physically addictive. But a person may begin to think and they become, almost can become obsessed with the drug. So this obsession that people have where they can't stop thinking about the drug, um, it works via positive reinforcement. right? So uh, that is another type of dependence. You have a physical chemical dependence and a psychological dependence. Different classifications for drugs. I'll move through these rather quickly. But we have amphetamines. This is uh, methamphetamine, crystal meth. You have uh, cocaine, whether it's crack cocaine or whether it's powder cocaine. So uh, crack cocaine is simply powder co cocaine that is diluted, cut, mixed with baking soda, uh, cooked in the stove on a, in the kitchen oftentimes. Uh, it has been associated with sort of the street drug, kind of a misnomer, um, but both are basically doing the same thing. Crack or powder cocaine are uh, having this, the same highly stimulant, very addictive impact. Uh, nicotine, nicotine, whether it is vaped or whether it is smoked old school style or whether it is used through chewing tobacco, smokeless tobacco, comes in many varieties and forms nowadays. Uh, caffeine is, is a legal stimulant uh, and we're consuming very large uh, copious amounts of caffeine in our culture. You can see is the chart. 
120 milligrams for brewed coffee and people and that's just for eight ounces in our society people are now getting these tremendously large coffees now caffeine does have some stimulant effects it can be good for focus but at, like anything else it can be uh, abused so coffee is a diuretic people can become dehydrated now from too much coffee uh, moving on to depressants we have barbiturates uh, benzos benzodiazepines and then also uh, we have alcohol now a lot of people have a hard time thinking or realizing alcohol is a depressant and probably one severe side effect of barbiturates is that oftentimes people who are using barbiturates or benzodiazepines are also adding alcohol so I have a close family member who uh, became an alcoholic this person was drinking a bottle of vodka a day and when they begin to pair this with uh, with benzos they begin to pair this with sleeping pills also um, you know, basically sedatives and tranquilizers uh, they began to have seizures and this is where a lot of people have died and overdosed and some famous people as well mixing barbiturates or downers with alcohol very very dangerous uh, you might, might want to take a screenshot this is what happens in the brain when people are intoxicated alcohol poisoning even a lethal dose of alcohol is possible with narcotics, you probably know that uh, we have an opioid crisis. Opium poppies are used to create heroin and, and other narcotics that are basically strong pain relievers. So morphine comes in and opioids come in many different shapes and sizes, but you, uh, a few. Hydroco hydrocodone is a very popular one. Um, fentanyl. It's probably one that's a very well-known street drug. And, and what's happened is a lot of people may have back pain or neck pain. They go to the doctor. The doctor prescribes all sorts of pain meds. They simply read the label. It says, use all of these. So they do. Uh, and then they begin to take, uh, they get refills and they take more. And before you know it, they're, they're addicted. And this is uh, because they're expensive we now have passed legislation in our country makes it difficult for doctors to prescribe them and so it is it's actually gotten so bad that people uh, when they become addicted to opioids uh, they they run out of money they may lose their job uh, and so they may lead might go to to heroin heroin is a street version of a street version of an opioid it's cheaper and there are many people on the street today uh, in a full-blown heroin addiction who began as high school principals and teachers, very professional people. So we do need to be aware of the op opioid crisis. And then finally, hallucinogens such as LSD, um, also known as acid, PCP, MDMA or the rave drug, uh, Molly's is a, basically a version of MDMA. Um, marijuana is placed here just for uh, lack of a better place to put it. Some people may have hallucinogenic effects with marijuana, um, but very, very dangerous things are happening. There's a lot of synthetic marijuana, uh, such as spice, and there's lots of deaths that can happen here as well. Um, and so for this subject and signing off with this chapter, the most important thing is that we're going to focus in what happens in the brain under drugs. So when I was a kid in the 80s, you might have seen this commercial on YouTube, but uh, President Reagan's wife had an uh, initial had an initiative, just say no, Nancy Reagan, and you know received federal dollars. And because of this, you know, it's a famous frying pan, right? This is your brain, and here comes the egg. This is your brain on drugs. They drop the egg in the frying pan. Uh, it's a very very simplistic way of thinking of it. Um, I want to challenge you to sort of. Uh, view the, the, the drug reality in our culture, the opioid crisis, uh, the crystal meth um, crisis, uh, the, the opioid epidemic, I think would be safe to use that phrase.
try to use all of these and look at all of them in and through the lens of psychology. There have been documentaries of, and, and even reality TV shows where psychologists um, will study what's happening uh, physiologically and psychologically as people are under the influence of different drugs. So there are some resources out there for you. Okay, uh, I hope this was as, as interested, interesting to you as it was to me. Um, I love having this conversation in the classroom. I look forward to hearing what you might have to say in the discussion board. Uh, here's something else for you to think about. If you have a loved one or relative that has uh, become addicted to drugs uh, or alcohol, um, in the discussion board, feel free to mention this if you feel comfortable, only if you feel comfortable. Uh, and we're going to respect people as they disclose things, not sharing this around. But what are some of the withdrawal symptoms that you have seen? Right? That's a very uh, thought-provoking question, but I'll throw that out there. Right? What sort of withdrawal symptoms have you experienced as your friend's family perhaps have become entangled in the addiction crisis. So I look forward to reading this. Uh, Y'all take care and be safe.